Welcome everyone to the Adventurers Club. Uh, welcome back on this Thursday night. <laughs> Hopefully we're bringing you some more interesting content tonight. If you like what you see, uh, please subscribe to the channel and uh, pick us up every week. You'll, you'll have some really fun times listening to some of these stories that we bring you. Uh, also, for those of you who spend a lot of time on the road, go look for our podcasts under Adventures Club of Los Angeles. You can find them on any of the providers, pretty much, and uh, you can take these talks on the road with you. Keep yourself entertained while you're staring at bumpers. <laughs> so uh, tonight we have with us uh, Paul Graves. Good evening. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Really appreciate you coming out. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Paul's uh, one of our newest members. Maybe the newest. I don't. I'm not sure. <laughs> so uh, we're going to initiate him by uh, making him talk about himself tonight. And uh, is the bucket of blood ready yet up there? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're still waiting for the for the goat. No. On the bucket of blood. Sorry. Oh. That was a joke. <laughs> Moving swiftly along. So, Paul, <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, some of your background. and Yeah. Um, well, I, I grew up in Kentucky, and I've been living out here for almost 20 years now. Um, I, you know, my parents instilled this sense of adventure in me, and it, it was pretty wonderful. They actually did these things called what they called top secret missions, and I've since carried them forward into my adult life as well. And it was really just this sense of the world is big and we can go see it and what's out there. And it doesn't need to be on the other side of the world to classify as an adventure. It could be something in your own backyard. And I, I really kind of prescribed myself to that philosophy. Um, travel bug for sure. Uh, no questions asked about that. I, after I graduated college, I actually took a job that had a lot of travel and that it, well, it took me up to Alaska. And, and all over as well. Um, the US, Canada, Guam, Japan. It was great. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to share some of those stories about the Great White North. So, so Guam is not. It's not a part of tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Um, I mean, it is a, a US territory. Sure. Um, but shockingly, it's, it's like the. Las Vegas destination for Japanese tourists because it's really? so close, direct flights. Wow. It was actually easier for me to get to Guam flying through Tokyo than it was direct or any other way. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a fun, very small island, very militarized and, you know, heavy U.S. military presence there. But, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting little place. I, I actually, <laughs> I flew in to have a meeting with, um, with some people within the military. I was doing some consulting. Mm -hmm. And the, the job that I had that was so heavily travel vested was this um, engineering consulting company doing swimming pools, water parks, rec centers, all over the world, and mm -hmm. doing the design and engineering form. And it was really just this uh, niche industry with a lot of travel. And on my trip to Guam, I, I flew in, it's not an easy place to get to, so I had to build in a couple buffer days. And I had my meeting, and you know, a lot of these travels were all over the world, but for such a short meeting, yeah. um, where you have to see something in person. It's construction. You can't just see everything over a, a Zoom call or a mm -hmm. FaceTime. So I was there overseeing some construction, and everything was fine, and I had some time to kill. And I brought, I knew that Guam has this fascinating uh, underwater, you know, scuba life and reef mm -hmm. life and drop off life and just, um, you know, a lot of wrecks. And I was really eager to go diving. So there's, there's effectively one perimeter road that rings the entire island. And on my day off there, or my, you know, my day there, I was trying to find someone to scuba dive with and ask if I could jump on a boat and go out for a day. And there's only a handful of dive shops, and I stopped at every single one, and they all said no. And finally, the last one that I stopped at, the dive shop said no, but there's this old salty man who's just sitting in the corner over there uh, with this shirt that says, world's best grandfather on it. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and he's like, I'm going out tonight. You can come with me. 
And but I immediately said yes <laughs> yes before I like pieced everything else together that hey, what's your name that would have been a good yes. first question <laughs> are um, you where, where are you <laughs> going <laughs> uh, yeah how do I know you're not gonna take me off a boat and dump me in the middle of the ocean anyway I got to talking with him and he's this former Navy SEAL former collegiate swimmer like I was mm -hmm. and actually knew a bunch of the same people just a couple generations prior that I knew Oh, very interesting. And he actually swam for a man named Doc Councilman, who was the U.S. Olympic coach for swimming back in the 60s and 70s, as well as the uh, coach at Indianapolis, or sorry, at University of Indiana. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, we all ran in the same world. And he's retired on Guam to dive, and he actually meets with and teaches diving to uh, Micronesians, specifically from the island of Yap at the time. Uh. And we went out diving with 15, 15 year olds who have dropped out of high school, but the way that they can make money is becoming a dive instructor and going back to their islands or, you know, any of the islands in Micronesia mm -hmm. and doing, you know, dive trips and, and that, yeah, and opening their own business. So he was really trying to teach and push that sport forward. Um, oh, very yeah, it, we had a great night dive, and it was it was a fun little, you know, walk in beach dive. But it was yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was a good time. So it's amazing sometimes the connections that you make in the weirdest places. Yeah, absolutely. You would never the, expect <laughs> the world is small. Yes, I wouldn't want to paint it, right? That's what they yeah. say. So we've run into uh, we've run into people crossing through an airport that we had been on a trip with <laughs> in some obscure place and. Both of our flights passed through these airports at the same time and saw them. And yeah. The coincidence is incredible sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it truly is. So, so you, you're a diver. I'm a diver. Yep. Um, do you still dive? I try to. Uh, I haven't been frequently. The last place that I dove was um, in Bali, actually. I was there on my honeymoon a few years back. There are worse places? Uh, not many. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place and just wonderful life. And, you know, my favorite thing is not going out and trying to find the, the big animal, just, you know, looking at the little life and just following or even staying in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, my dad and I went scuba diving multiple times uh, in the Bay Islands of Honduras on Roatan. Wow. Okay. And... We went in the early 2000s, and I've been back a handful of other times, but what really brings me back there, it's one of the few places that I've continuously gone back on my own, is there's night dive action where these bioluminescence uh, appear. Oh. Yeah, and it's, it's triggered around the full moon, so I would always try and coordinate my trip around that. Um, they're called the string of pearls. And, you know, most bioluminescence are activated by movement in the water. Mm -hmm. And these... You stay perfectly still. You find a sand patch, you go down, you rest. And then these string, the, you, first you'll start to see a light and then another little light. And they come out on their own naturally. Oh. And it's a, it's a small little bioluminescent uh, creature that drops these little bioluminescent drops. And they, they're called string of pearls. Oh. They're beautiful. So they sink and... Yeah, and then they, they don't... I can't remember if they flash, quite honestly, yeah. but... I would spend an entire hour, you know, just doing a night dive right there, just same sand patch, just watching them. And after enough time, it becomes this meditative state where your breathing is moving in sync and you forget that you're underwater and it just feels like you're in another galaxy. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a religious experience. So. And this was in Rotan? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Studich just came back from there. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'll have to chat with him about that. Yeah. He, he, I'm sure he enjoyed it. Uh, he hooked us up with a speaker, actually, who's going to be talking. Really? Uh, his photographer on the reefs there. So. Wow. Looking forward to that talk. Um, yeah, same here. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So from Guam, um, when we first talked, we were talking about swimming pools in Alaska. Well... In the Arctic Circle. So yeah, yeah. Be, yeah. Alaska's a Correct. big state. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that just didn't go together <laughs> for me for some reason until you explained it. Yeah. 
But uh, so how how did you end up going so, to Alaska? So like I said, I worked Arctic at this engineering circle. company, and we designed swimming pools and water parks and sports centers all over. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not the big, you know, wet and wild all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, th those are farther and few between. But in Alaska, in the 80s, in the 70s, all of these local villages in the North Slope, which is the most upper portion of Alaska, above the Arctic Circle Line, uh, all these villages had swimming pools built in the 30s. And then in the 70s and the 80s, they had, uh, or sorry, they had schools built in the 30s. And then in the 70s and the 80s, they had swimming pools built. Oh, okay. And the reason that they that the pools were built was purely for drowning prevention education. Mm -hmm. These villages have anywhere from 150 to, you know, a few hundred people. Some are, some are much larger. Mm -hmm. But the ones that I was going to were these really small, sparsely populated villages. And they are subsistence villagers. Yeah. And they're hunting you know, in the summertime. They're picking and foraging for berries, uh, you know, hunting eggs and, you know, uh, terrestrian or, you know, land animals. And then sure. in, the, uh, in the winter, which is actually their preferred month because it's easier to get around. Everything's frozen mm. and faster. <laughs> Uh, there's no, you know, there's no, no lake mud. or no mud, no <laughs> bog to climb over. Uh, they're always hunting whale, walrus, polar bear, mm. and, you know, living on that. It's not that they hunt this for the pride of it. They hunt it and then they eat it. Yeah. And the entire village shares in every feast that they come back with the harvest. Now you said these were small villages. Get, sense of scale? How many people are? 150 in people in Point Lay at the time. That's a pretty small village. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my high school graduating class was, you know, 10 times that. Yeah, I mean, you have to be careful who you marry in that, <laughs> in that village. <laughs> I, I'll stay out of that one. <laughs> but yeah, these villages are very small. So the communities are inherently very tight, very small. Mm -hmm. And drowning, when a drowning occurs, it's a, it's a true tragedy anytime. But there, it just becomes even more visualized because everyone knows everybody and every, you know, it, it does take the village to raise a person. So uh, these pools were built. Well, during my other travels to Alaska for work, um, I started hearing about these village uh, pools that were in disrepair or closed. Mm -hmm. And I ended up working and doing some consulting with the borough up there, which is the governing agency, North Slope Borough and wrote inspection reports and, you know, for the entire school, working with some of the local architects. And then we got funding to renovate these schools and the pools specifically. Uh -huh. So we took something that wasn't really there and added something new back into the community. And it's really interesting because the community was this you know, very tight knit community. So when a white guy from yeah. down south mm -hmm. <laughs> comes into town, it's news. Yeah. And, you know, they're always very standoffish and skittish. Like, what are you doing here? And why are you here? Yeah. And when I tell them that I'm helping their school and, you know, working with them and listening to them, not just here's what you get, their tone totally changes. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, you know, this, you know, yeah back and you're, forth and you're excitement doing good. yeah <laughs> now when i say schools and villages you know 150 people there aren't that many homes but there's also no other infrastructure there so the school is the community center uh, and it opens at 5 in the morning and closes at 10 o'clock at night and the pot of coffee is on at 5 in the morning and the last one goes off at 10 at night uh, and anyone can come in and you know get out of the storm they can have a communal thing. It's extremely communal. This is where they play basketball. This is where the tools and the workshop are. And everyone has this free access to this community. So the school is a community center as well. It's an, it's an art center. It's where, you know, crafts are done. It's where you learn the culture. Like as a, a local native, you know, they're really preaching and trying to really institute this culture that um, they're afraid it's dying out. And 
all the signs there are both in English and the native Inuit language. Ah, okay. It, yeah, it's, so they preserve it. Absolutely. Um, I think there, we actually have some pictures of the school, and they're all built up on stilts just from the, yeah, you can see the school there. Uh, it's the largest of the buildings in town, uh, but then they're built up and elevated so that wind can blow underneath and snow can blow underneath so that snow drifts don't pile all the way up and block out windows or cause Crush structural damage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so. so it probably goes without saying, but the swimming pools are indoor pools. Yeah, um, that's always one of the rings. first questions. <laughs> yeah, they're these beautiful indoor pools. And they're really, really tiny. And when I mean tiny, I mean they are 10 foot wide by 50 foot wide. Oh, um, and that's, okay. that's you know, sm much smaller than just a, a regular high school pool here in Los Angeles or anywhere here uh, in the U.S. But, you know, this is the U.S. And that's a really interesting point is that these pools are not for competitive swimming. Yeah. They're there to teach you how to not drown. And so they will take young, you know, young people and put them in their Arctic gear and just push them in the water and teach them how to turn over and self, you know, self-assess themselves and then, uh, you know, teach them how to climb up and out of the pool. Um, and that's really to help people when they're out fishing because yeah. they're not going out in big trawlers. They're going out in little flat bottom skiffs, you know, aluminum skiffs with a little... 10 horse motor on the back and trying to hunt a bowhead whale. Yeah. That's ambitious. <laughs> it's, and they do it all the time. Yeah. So we're trying to make their life better. And that's what it was. So give us an idea when, if you fall out of a boat, what are you wearing when you- You know, I, I don't know all the details <laughs> on <laughs> that, but you know, they're not wearing full body foul weather gear. Mm -hmm. That's actually been the problem is if you are a native Alaskan, um, you are four times more likely to drown than any other uh, person in any other state in the United States. Four times more likely. And yeah. it's purely because there's so much water up there. Uh, fishing is, and hunting are a way of life yeah. that they're exposed to it. So this is really, these pools, we built them to really help create a more safe culture of being around the water. And, you know, they're, they're beautiful. They're just really small, tiny pools. I think there's a, yeah, there's the picture right there. Um, and you can see that they're not that big, but really it's just to teach people how to not drown. Yeah. And, you know, I have to believe that it helped. Oh, but getting up there is an immense challenge. It's, you know, living here in Los Angeles and wanting to fly anywhere, you can just hop out of LAX and fly up there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't fly directly into these villages. And getting there, like I said, is a challenge. You know, flying into Anchorage, yeah, there are direct flights from LA to Anchorage, but then in Anchorage, you're not staying in the main airport and flying to these villages. It's not a, you know, 747 or a 737. I would have to hire a bush pilot and uh. fly from Anchorage to where I was going or Fairbanks and then out to another village or sometimes even flying up to Barrow, which is the mo northernmost village town in the United States. I mean, it's the very tip top of Alaska. Yeah. And then flying in these little bush planes. And when I say bush planes, it's, you know, a little Cessna and it's me and the yeah. pilot what? and he's dropping me off. There's no one else going. Yeah. Maybe so, there's some material that someone, you know, promised to have delivered on the next plane, but it's me that is being delivered. <laughs> and Throwing we, this stuff out on the yeah. runway as he's taking off. <laughs> yeah, well, at one point I even asked the pilot, I was like, look, I'm only gonna, I only need to be here for three hours. Mm -hmm. Can you wait? And he's like, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna wait. Like, I'm gonna fly back or I, you know, call me when you're done. And then, you know, if the, if the weather's okay, yes. I'll come get you. And more than half the time, the weather was not okay. Mm. So I would be stuck in these villages and Going up there was always an act of preparation as a Boy Scout mm -hmm. <laughs> because these villages don't have hotels. They don't have restaurants. Um, and if I was up there and staying there and would be prepared, I would have to bring my own food. Yeah. And, sometimes, and I would bring my own sleeping bag 
and then sleep on the library in the school, sleep on the floor in the library at the sleep school. Sleep next to the coffee urn. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's the warmest place, right? No, the, um, the, the library was padded because it was the reading area. Uh. <laughs> it was one of the only carpeted areas in the school. Um, so I would sleep there. And yeah, I, I remember at one point in time, uh, after two days there being stuck because foul weather came in, one of the local villagers said, yeah, okay, come on over. Come into my house. And, you know, it's, it's a small, they're very small homes and, you know, not that many rooms, but a couch was better than the floor. Yeah. So it was, a, it was always an active adventure. And as you know, you always just have to roll with the punches. But I would get these phone calls asking me to go up there, relatively short order. Sometimes they could be planned out, but other times it was, we need you up there and we need you now. Mm-hmm. So one time and I went up, it was uh, a Friday that I got the phone call. I was like, okay, I'll book my ticket. So I booked my ticket up to Anchorage and called the bush pilots and, hey, who's, who can get me there? So I'm flying out on uh, Sunday, or sorry, on Monday morning. I get up there on Monday into Anchorage. Th- that's the easiest part of the journey. Yes. <laughs> and the stepping now it, off point. <laughs> yeah. And then I fly from Anchorage to Barrow, and that, that was my plan. So I was supposed to leave on Monday. Well, Sunday I get a phone call and my, my overnight in Barrow, I was gonna stay at this hotel called Top of the World Hotel. It's the only hotel in Barrow. It's the biggest village north of Fairbanks, but it's the only one and it's called Top of the World. So I get this phone call and I'm supposed to go up there and I, I miss the call. So I listen to the voicemail hours later and it's someone saying, hey, this is Top of the World Hotel. We're sorry we can't honor your reservation. Our hotel burned down. Oh. Okay, I guess that's please. a valid excuse. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, please don't fly up here. Like, there's nowhere else for you to stay. Mm-hmm. And I remember it was September. And I was, I was like, well, I have to get up there. I was invited by the village elders to go up and talk to them. And that's mm-hmm. an honor, a privilege but not something that I can reschedule. Like I can't Mm. reschedule that. The village elders came in from a hunt and they were around, needed to okay the plans. So I decide I've got my sleeping bag anyway. It's only 20 degrees in Barrow. I can (laughs) can sleep outside, I can sleep somewhere, I'll figure it out. So I get on the plane, I go up to Anchorage and Right before I left town, I made a phone call to someone at a church Mm -hmm. and at the, uh, at the Mormon church up in Barrow. Mm -hmm. And I get a voice message when I land in Anchorage and he's like, Hey, if you need a place to stay, we can open our church for you. Uh, It's like, okay, this is great. So I land in Anchorage. I now have a place to stay and I fly up to Barrow and I land and I call, his name was Andy Mm -hmm. and I, comes and picks me up at the airport with his two kids in the car. (laughs) And he's like, have you ever been to Barrow? No. And so he drives me around town and Barrow is right on the coast of the Beaufort Sea. And I think there's a picture, it's it's a whaling community. Um, There's a picture of, yeah, the bowhead whales right there. And that's looking at the, uh, that's two bowhead whales looking out at the, looking north onto the Buford Sea. So you could see it's not that cold. It's probably 30, 25 degrees Mm -hmm. there. And Andy's like, okay, come on in. And he pulls up and we pull up to his house and that's his church. Oh. Oh. And I'm a little taken back, but roll with the punches, gotta go. Mm -hmm. And Andy and his wife cooked a dinner for me. I got to meet, meet their kids, we chatted. They used to live in Los Angeles, actually in Riverside for, oh. <laughs> a, for a series of months at one mm-hmm. point in time. And it was just a, you know, a, a really good memory and these you know, really nice people taking someone in. And then the next morning, they drove me back to the airport and I got on my bush plane and I Left. flew into Point Lay. <laughs> um, I, sp- I landed in Point Lay, met with the elders, the meeting went wonderful got stuck up there again because of weather. And finally, um, 
you know, I, I would walk around town when I was up there. And yeah, that's one of, that's some of the imagery up there of, uh, that's actually a different village, but that's Anaktuvik Pass. That's one of the villages and you can see it's, you know, it's just constantly filled with snow, even it, you know, even in September. The, uh, the interesting thing though is when I was up there on this trip, one of the villagers said, hey, come on over. I'm going to give you some muktuk. And I always say yes, <laughs> but I had no idea what I was getting into. Yes. So muktuk is whale skin, whale blubber. Uh. And there, there, we have, I think we have a picture of that. Yeah, right there. Um, so it's, it's, it's frozen whale fat with skin around it. And we cut off a little piece and thawed it. And it it's looks a, a little bit masubi, but not quite. <laughs> it tastes... Um, I mean, I'm not one to judge someone else's food, but I wouldn't say that I would go back for it. Um, usually it's boiled down into like a, they reduce the fat and then add berries to it and add some snow and it's called uh -huh. uh, Inuit ice cream. Okay. But I didn't get that. I just got the straight whale fat. Um, so how describe it? <laughs> it's, it's gelatinous. Mm -hmm. It's very, very chewy. It's salty and tastes stale. But, you know, but high I got to eat content. whale fat, yeah. <laughs> and so that's, I mean, that's... Probably not that many people can make that claim. <laughs> no, I, I don't think that many can. Um, but the guy, you know, it was just one of the villagers. He, he then pulled out, he's like, we're going to have some heart. And, he pull, and he, this guy was just really excited to share food and just share, to share more than yeah. anything else. And we chatted and uh, he pulled out some... Yeah, there, there's one of the pictures of, uh, that's a caribou heart. And he just chopped it up and we, he put it in the skillet and fried it up for me. And, you know, it's, that was good. I, I would say, you know, yeah. that was good. But, um, a little chewy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little, a little chewy. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of, once, you know, once you're accepted in, and it took me a while to get accepted, multiple trips at least, yeah. um, you know, the villagers got to see me again yeah. and would start to share things like that. They start to have relationships. Yeah. yeah. And I would be up there for multiple days, like I said. Um, and I was lucky enough to see the Northern Lights one time when I was up there. Mm. Uh, but yeah, once or twice when I was up there. And, you know, these beautiful, they dance. They, I don't know if you've ever seen them, Ken, but... I haven't. It's on our list of things to do. It's a must-do. It's a must-do. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, this, this picture here, uh, you know, they, they dance in colors. And it's, I mean, the science behind it, I don't want to go into, but it's this, like, dancing just light, and they're beautiful. And when they're happening, at least in one of the villages that I was in that I saw that, that was in Anaktuvik Pass, which is kind of, well, it's in Gates of the Arctic National Park. It's a village in the national park. Okay. Um, the villagers would come out and start whistling because oh. that's part of their, like what their ancestors would do is whistle to the lights. So it's a spiritual yeah. thing for them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just being outside on the edge of the world where you feel completely isolated and yet, you know, relatively embraced because you're around people that if you need something, they will help you. Yeah. Uh, and yet, this is 2010 to 2015 when I was going up there. Hmm. When I first started going there, cell phones were not prevalent. Everyone loved watching Wheel of Fortune and uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Those were the really? big shows. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they were, you know, satellite TV. You could yeah. beam in American culture. And these are Americans. And to see that juxtaposition of culture was really interesting. Yeah. And by the time that 2015 rolled around, so over the course of five years, everyone had a cell phone. Everyone had high-speed internet. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was first going up there, if I needed to get, call, my, call my bush pilot to say I'm ready to go, I'd get on a ham radio, uh, call yeah. someone at an airport if I could get through, and then they would then relay that message to the bush pilot, and a few hours later four or five hours later, if the weather was good, the pilot would come landing and I'd walk out to the runway. <laughs> so, It's amazing how technology sort of leapfrogs in, in remote areas mm -hmm. where all of a sudden 
you know, I've been in villages where there was one truck shared amongst everybody. Yeah. But every other house had a had a satellite dish on it, and, <laughs> and everyone was carrying cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> Strange comparison. It is. I think we have a picture of um, there's a house on the edge of on the edge of the sea, and it's got a satellite dish on it. You know, um, just these. Well, I mean, if we can get to it, yeah, that's that's it right there. That's a that's a beautiful image of just one of the houses on the sea. This is actually in in Point Hope, which is a little bit further south than Point Lay. Point Hope is a really interesting town, and I can, I'll tell you about that. But you can see the satellite dish on the roof. Yeah. The dog sleds, the dogs outside, overlooking the ocean, or the frozen ocean, yes. mind you, the uh, Chukchi Sea, and then the satellite dish. So it's, you know, it was a really enlightening and beautiful place to be in. I loved it. I genuinely loved it. Mm -hmm. um, one time when I was up there, I... You know, it was evening and walking around town. And, you know, this, what's interesting is right around Thanksgiving uh, through mid-February, the sun goes down hmm. and doesn't actually crest over the skyline anymore ah. so, or over the horizon. So it's dark yeah. all the time. You may or get a little bit. Twilight or dark. Yeah, you may get a little bit of twilight, mm -hmm. but it's dark. It's yeah. genuinely dark. And I was walking around one time, I don't remember exactly what time of year it was, but it was the evening. And one of the guys, you know, one of the local villagers saw me and said, hey, are you here for the school? Yeah, we got to talking for a minute or so. Hmm. He said, come over, I got to show you something. And <laughs> I'll never forget, I, mean, I, I believe we have a picture of it, but he pulls out the scalped skull of a polar bear. And the day before, he had killed a polar bear. Oh, wow. And the entire village was eating polar bear, wow. which is a very dense, dense meat. It's, yeah. um, it's very gamey and mm. just very, very dense, very tough. But, you know. It's what you have. It's what you have. <laughs> and he's standing there. And, and yeah, it baits whale blubber. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely tastes better than whale blubber. <laughs> but that's actually the picture right there. And you can see, he's just this really proud man and it gets me every time I see it because he has this SpongeBob SquarePants jacket on yeah. holding a polar bear skull <laughs> and it's that's when it hits me like this is America and these are Americans and yet totally different than what anybody would consider to be yeah. the traditional lower 48 American. So far out of the realm of yeah. imagination for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. It's funny, I saw that I saw that photo and I didn't realize what he was holding <laughs> until you just told me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got to eat a lot of interesting food up there, I'll say that. Yeah. Um, now you're kind of a foodie, right? I wouldn't say I'm a foodie, or but I, like enjoy, I enjoy food. Yes. <laughs> you like trying different things. Yeah. I'll say yes to everything once. Yes. <laughs> if it's on a plate, I'll try it. If someone else has eaten it, I'm definitely trying it. <laughs> can always spit it out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I got I to gotta share this story because it is about the food. Um, mm -hmm. So Andy, my Mormon buddy up in, uh, up in Barrow, yes. about three months later, I was going back up there, and I, I called him. I was like, hey, Top of the world is still burned down. I need a night in Barrow. Can I stay with you? And he said, oh, absolutely, no problem. So fly up to Anchorage, fly up to Barrow, land. He picks me up, go have dinner at his house, you know, see the kids again, read him bedtime stories, sleep on the couch. But I brought, so my, ba my travel bag was always, you know, just like a couple changes of clothes, some food for me. Yeah. And a sleeping bag. Oh. And, you know, just a backpacker's ready to go. Sure. Well, I brought an extra bag this trip. And I brought 40 pounds of California oranges. Oh. <laughs> and in the winter in Barrow, which is when I went up there on this trip, these were more valuable than gold. I mean, the, 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 the bartering power of the California orange was pretty powerful <laughs> there. They, I mean, they looked at me like, 
Like I had just given them as much money as they could possibly imagine. Here, these all for us. That's ex that's actually what his wife said, and she's like, "I we no, we can't we can't take these." I said, "I brought them. I'm not taking them back to California. We, <laughs> they won't be they grow on trees down here." <laughs> and they actually had th so they had this um, indoor greenhouse, mm -hmm. and it would grow one tomato every couple weeks and a little bit of lettuce. So produce up there is not only prohibitively expensive because it's shipped in from Anchorage, mm -hmm. but it's just everything up there is expensive. You know, a can of Coke at the time was like $4. Wow. Um, a gallon of milk is $10. So, you know, to get 40 pounds of fresh citrus was just a treat. And I, I, I loved giving it to them. I wish that I had gone back up more times to see them, but that was my last trip seeing them. Yeah. And so no, they just, fr they no fruit of the month club. No, <laughs> it was no fruit of the month club. I, I wish, but uh, who knows? Maybe I'll go back up and see them again. But yeah, just their excitement and joy seeing, you know, opening and smelling the citrus. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if their kids had ever had fresh oranges before, but they definitely had, they had orange juice that night. It's a thing so, now. Yeah, <laughs> it was fun. It was really fun. fun. So I'm curious about um, on the pools when you were, were they being reconditioned or rebuilt? Uh, how much work was? Yeah, that's a great question. To them? So the building envelope was being reconstructed as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing some addition work, uh, but the natatorium, which is the indoor pool space, Mm -hmm. uh, was completely gutted. We took it down to stud and to concrete structure mm -hmm. uh, and then put a complete new membrane, waterproofing membrane, interior and exterior, which is actually a really interesting construction method. Um, to be a licensed engineer in Alaska, you have to take an Arctic engineering class, oh. which I went through and got my license up there. Um, it's, it's, there's some really interesting facts about that I'll, I'll come back to, but the building envelope system had to be completely redesigned because natatoriums are held at around 85 degrees Fahrenheit at about 50% humidity. Mm. Well, that's a difficult environment to construct here in the lower 48, even here in Southern California. Yeah. But you know, compound that with the fact that now we're in the Arctic tundra and temperatures go down to minus 50 and 0% humidity. So the moisture drive is really, ex you know, the mm. moisture and thermal drive is really prevalent. Um, there's actually, I think, a picture of, you know, a leak when the building envelope fails. These stalactites and stalagmites of, oh, they just freeze of ice nature. just freeze through and create this core. Oh, I, I, I don't know if we have it, but <laughs> um, because the buildings are elevated up mm -hmm. and underneath, you know, there are these, you know, it's four inches of thermal insulation. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the images right there. You can see that you know, when something breaks, it breaks pretty systemically. Um, so what are we, are we looking at the underside of? This is the underside of the, one of the buildings. Okay. And what's interesting about that is that this had broken off the day before we got there and you could see all the thermal insulations completely broken out. Mm. But then in the natatorium space, so once we repaired the, the building structure and the building skin, in the natatorium space, all the material was flown up from the lower 48 to create what's effectively an erector set style swimming pool. Um, mm -hmm. I think we have one of the structures on that. And it's these A-frame, yeah, th this is the image. It's, that's a great one. So the deck is completely removed. It, it'll be, the deck will be at the top of the pool edge. And what we're looking at is effectively becoming a crawl space underneath the pool deck. So this A-frame retains the water interior to the pool. So the pool is on the far right side, and then that crawl space is where all the piping and proce process piping and uh, systems would go. So that becomes the support for the membrane. Yeah. Sort of like the Doughboy pool yeah, the, approach well, or Yeah, something. actually, the Doughboy pools, it's funny you say that, <laughs> that was actually what was installed in the 70s, the oh. brand name of Doughboy okay. pool. Um, <laughs> because that's what was you know, constructed all over at that point in time. Sure. You could pick it up and fly it anywhere in the world and install them. So the question I have is how do they get the materials there? Is it all flown in? 
Yeah, um, is everything. The, are the runways big enough to handle? Yeah, so all runways up there are extended runways yeah. for winter weather. So even a small little bush plane during uh, winter season has an extended runway length because they'll slide on ice. And these extended runways become, you know, the shipping lanes for interior villages during the summer season. And then if it's, an, if it's a port city, so Point Lay, Point Hope, they don't have ports per se, but they can put a barge out or they can put a shipping container out at sea and then ferry the material back and forth. Oh. Uh, getting material into these villages is extremely expensive and you get one shot to do it. So everything effectively becomes that erector set, like I said, where it's all bundled and packaged and palletized yeah. and really indexed so that the construction is really just, you know, follow that Lego instruction kit and everything's up there. But when it comes to specialty systems like this, everything's manufactured in the lower 48, assembled here in the lower 48, disassembled, palletized and sent up. And then the people who assembled it and disassembled it in the lower 48 end up flying up and doing the install up there. Hmm. So I think this particular pool was constructed in uh, Indianapolis. So a couple of Hoosiers flew up there and had to do the install. <laughs> they, were, uh, they were out of place, that's for sure. <laughs> but then they stay in these Kwanzaa huts. Um, you know, they, they erect these Kwanzaa huts for the construction workers because they're oh, up there okay. for a so they bring short period of time. Yeah, that's one of, the, that's one of the images. So you can see that they, you know, they'll, there's four of them there. That not only holds the material that they're storing, but that holds all the people and the cook and everything, and there's a picture of the interior as well. You can see this is the the kitchen. So this is, these are fabric construction. It looks like. Yeah, it's like a. On a frame. It's it's a it's a frame. It's a it's one of the old like World War II Kwanzaa huts that they would you know fly in and put anywhere that they needed to, and yeah. you know it's just the the bow frame with some type of draped material and uh, tarped plastic to provide some type of heat barrier and waterproofing. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess you have to just look at it as like summer camp. You'll get through it eventually <laughs> and come back. Right? Like, all you got to do is live to tell the tale. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it, it was, um, I, I fell in love with the state. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the culture. It's, it's a place that I really do intend to go back um, and talk to the villagers, and, you know, because I when I was there, I was always in, this, in their, like in their space. So I, I, was, I cannot say that I assimilated for many reasons, but I definitely just embraced my time there. And you know, one of the kids who was really into hunting was also into crafting because that was what his family had taught him, that family tradition. Mm. And he had made this mask and he, the mask is caribou hide and wool uh, sorry, uh, wolf fur, caribou hide, caribou, and polar bear. And that, yeah, that's actually an image of the mask. I really oh. wish that I still had it, but moths destroyed it, uh. um, ate it from the inside out. But uh, that's, that's not only a traditional Inuit hunting mask, but that was actually one that he used. He made for himself and used. So they would wear this to protect from the elements? Yeah, purely for the elements. You can see that the eye slits are very narrowed. Yes. Um, and then it's actually just a true covering of the face to protect from, you know, from wind burn. So the narrow slits are for a form of sunglasses. Yeah, I mean, they would also wear sunglasses, but he, he was really embracing the culture. So he was hunting in this. This is a 15-year-old. Yeah. And I ended up buying two of them and... Um, yeah, I mean, just beautiful pieces of art that are made up there. And uh, one, of the, one of the guys in uh, Point Hope gave me this piece of baleen, which is from a bowhead whale. Um, it's just a beautiful little snippet of my personal history, but you know, sometimes I just like feeling yes. the, the actual baleen itself because oh. it's not from... You know, just, 150 years ago, that's from within the past 10 years. So what, 
What part of the whale is this? In? It's part of the jaw and part okay. of the mouth. Um, is it a filtering? It is, yeah. For feeding? Yeah, so bowhead whales have these large uh, filter feeder my, mouths and... Um, Very shiny. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. There was, there's no polish to it. He made his little initials on the lower side, uh, maybe on the, on the reverse, but... Um, oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's just a beautiful little artifact. And Hold that up for us, Ken, so we can, uh, so we can see oh. it. Folks can see it at home. And then uh, if you can point out where he uh, carved the initials, that'd be really neat. It's on the, okay. on the reverse side where your hand Other is. Side, uh, yeah, right there. So it's in the corner right here. Not sure if the camera can see that or not, but yeah, we got it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And just you. you know the the concept of the culture just being there and um, a, a lot of changes have been happening over the past generation up there. Um, the the embrace of the culture because of the assimilation of technology, just showing that you know so much can happen so quick. Uh, what's interesting is Barrow actually just changed their name in 2016. Barrow, the town of Barrow, which had been known as Barrow for a hundred years, changed their name. And I'm going to butcher it, but it's Uktuvik. And that's the native. So it's a traditional name. Yeah, they changed it back to the traditional name. And, and Denali. Colonial you know, namers. Of yeah. <laughs> um, you know, mountains are changing up there. Rivers are changing. And. And the, the villagers voted to make the change, and it became a really generational divide. The, the vote in Barrow, which uh, went to town vote, actually only passed by eight votes really? in 2016. Yeah. And it was a generational thing, purely generational. Lines. So was the older generation wanted to keep no, the No, the, old the older generation, you know, they were born in Barrow. Their parents were born in Barrow. Their grandparents were born in Barrow. Their great-grandparents were born in Barrow. But, you know, for them... The younger generation, they're really trying to hold on to what's left of the culture. Um, I mentioned the city of, or the village of Point Hope. I think it's like 450 people there. So it's one of the bigger ones. Yes. All these, uh, you know, the original name there was uh, Tigiac. Mm -hmm. And that's in the native language means uh, index finger. Oh. <laughs> and, and, I mean, it, it literally means the index yeah. finger because it's the the point that juts out into the Tukchi, uh, the Tukchi Sea. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Uktuvik means, there's a couple different variations on it, but it's either the land where the snow owls are or where the snow owls can be haunted. Ah, so. Okay. One's better for the snow owls than yeah, the other. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 and, and it's like, Another little village, like I mentioned, that's in Gates of the Arctic National Park, it's called Anaktuvik Pass. Mm -hmm. And that translates to land where the caribou poop, <laughs> because that's where the hunting was. Ah. And that's why a village is settled it's there. Easy to locate them. Yeah, <laughs> right? May as well live where you can hunt. Yeah. <laughs> so is there, um, it looks like they want to hang on to their traditions in a lot of, a lot of, uh, remote places, it's elsewhere in the world, it's common for the younger generation to want to move away, to go look for something else. Yeah. And how does that play in with, with this population? I wish that I knew the answer to that. Yeah. Um, you know, as much as I learned while I was up there, there's still a large void of my knowledge. So yeah. I don't, I re I don't really <laughs> like know the answer to that. Um, I can well, only have to be able to get a bush plane in to get out. In the yeah, place, so. <laughs> um, I, I did meet a kid when I was up there who I was talking with. He was one of their sports stars. He was a basketball player, mm -hmm. and this was in Anaktuvik Pass. Um, he he got to go play basketball down in Seattle. He was invited to go play basketball at a tournament down in Seattle, and when he came back, everyone asked him like, "Well, what was it like? You know, what was what was Seattle like?" And his response was, the trees are so big. And I remember mm. being a little surprised by that. And then, it, and then I realized, like, in the tundra, the trees grow to about this tall. Yeah. I mean, they may, it may take 30 years for them to grow to this tall, mm -hmm. but they're about this tall. And in Seattle... they can't get a root <laughs> system down. <laughs> well, the tundra is so cold. Yeah. And, you know, lichen grows everywhere, and lichen will eat whatever it possibly can. Mm. Um, 
but yeah, I was really taken by that by that response that he had. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, different people have different comparison baselines. Yeah, comparison. absolutely. <laughs> and and everyone there is extremely resourceful. Um, you use whatever you can get. Barrow is actually known as like the dump ground for cars because when a car dies there, it's too expensive to to remove it. So I think la uh, two years ago, there was actually a, a woman who was going around counting the number of broken cars. Uh -huh. But everyone's extremely resourceful because when it's to get things there, um, you have to fly it in and it's very pricey. There's, there's a picture of a, a fuselage of an airplane mm. in one of the villages in Anaktubic Pass. Yeah, right there. You can see that this fuselage has wow. now been turned into someone's house. That's and a, they live there. They've, you know. That's a large airplane. Yeah. <laughs> I, wish, I genuinely wish that I knew what plane it was, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's someone's house. Yeah. There's a little chimney on the far side. And we, you should have video and padded chairs and a little <laughs> galley. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Your exits are this way and yes. this way. <laughs> um, but when you're forced to live off of whatever you can, you make do with whatever you've got. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, you know, it, it was a true experience to get up there 15 times over five years, if not more frequently than that, and really try and immerse myself in that culture. Because even though I was going up there for work, and I had a job to do. The, my number one job was to provide added value to the community. Yeah. And I was meeting with the village elders and talking with them and listening to them. You know, I, I, the, the Inuits have consistently been taken advantage of over hundreds of years mm -hmm. and you know, I, that was not going to be my philosophy to go up there. Um, there was actually a, a plan just outside of Point Hope back in the 60s to use thermonuclear weapons to add a harbor, a safe harbor, in the village of Point Hope. Hmm. And... Uh, Seems counterintuitive somehow. <laughs> the 60s were a weird time. <laughs> But uh, Dr. Teller, who worked on the Manhattan Project and was the father of the hydrogen bomb, mm -hmm. he, um, he was lobbying to create and had the Atomic Energy Commission like, fully on board for creating peaceful nuclear you know, systems. And part of that was we can create a harbor within a place that doesn't have one. And he went up into... Alaska and was lobbying Alaska and had the support of JFK and this group of villagers in Point Hope said no and started asking questions and pointing mm -hmm. things out and you know they you know they lobbied for an environmental impact report mm -hmm. and that was not known at the time not ever done and Teller acquiesced to that and yeah, th there's a lot of back and forth on it, but um, you know, it was the history of white people coming in and saying, "This is how it's done." This is good for you. Yeah, and that's <laughs> or someone. <laughs> yeah, I was very cognizant of that going up there, yeah. and I was working with locals out of Anchorage. It wasn't me on my own. I would fly up there and I was traveling on my own, but you know, I had a support team as well, mm -hmm. and you know, I was I was heavily warned about that, just to be aware of what's going on. Yeah. So. Fascinating. Yeah, it really was. What a great experience to have behind you. <laughs> and a lot more in front of me. <laughs> yeah. Good. Do so, you have plans to go back or you think you'll be back? Yeah, um, I would actually love to go back. Um, I've been wanting to write about this, mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of go back and research and share, uh, research what's going on there, how the pools are being used, and to get stories from the locals. Yeah. And then, you know, write something about it. But uh, Corona put a little bit of a damper in all of that. So, yeah, I do plan to go back. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. And then come back here and tell more stories. Excellent. Yeah.
Would you like to open up for some questions? I'd if love that. Yeah, if there are any questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. It's wonderful to see your lovely faces in the chat. Uh, Ken, real quick, following up on that uh, initiation thing, uh, yes. the goat has <laughs> arrived. Um, so, okay. yeah, we'll do that after the show. Uh, first, All right. Yeah. <laughs> first question from the chat comes from Steve Adams. Thank you for the question, Steve. I was wondering... Uh, Steve wants to know, I was wondering if he had heard much talk amongst the locals concerning the Iditarod dog sled race. Oh, uh, I mean, that's a great question. I, I was in the northern part, uh, so much further north of Fairbanks. Um, there were always discussions of the Iditarod, but that's a, I believe the race is from Wasilla to, or from Fairbanks to Wasilla. Hmm. Um, it's not something that I followed. But I did get to meet a handful of people who actually raced in it. And yeah, the, the, dog, uh, the dog breeding culture up there is pretty prevalent. Well, they um, would be the people to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not something that I really followed or got into. I wish that I did. But uh, I always tried to coordinate a trip around the Iditarod. But uh, unfortunately, it just never happened. <laughs> I'll have to go back. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, next question is actually from me. Um, in going through your pictures here, there's a couple that uh, stand out that I don't think have had uh, their chance to shine yet. For example, can we go into a little bit of detail about this one here? Yeah, that's, um, you can see that's actually in the village. I, um, I believe that's in Barrow or Oktuvik. Um, and it's really just, you know, one of the traditional flagpoles that you would see that shows locations of cities and distance away. Um, because Barrow is the northernmost town in the United States, northernmost in Alaska, nor one of the northernmost in the world, um, people always like to go. And it kind of is a tourist destination, but definitely an off-the-beaten-path tourist destination. So they consider themselves the center of the world and everything else. Oh, they're the top <laughs> of the world, and everyone else is yeah, just <laughs> measured off of them. Um, yeah, I did actually, I, like I said, I, I got to spend a little bit of time up there, but I remember one time that I was up there I, in Barrow. I, as a swimmer, I could not help myself. I had to go in the ocean. Yes. And <laughs> the Beaufort Sea is freezing cold. So yeah, there's a picture uh, of me. So I've got my jacket on, I've got a hat. It's probably 30 degrees outside, 25 degrees outside. The water is, there's no ice in it, but it's really, really close to being iced over. And I, I've just got some shorts on underneath. And I ran in, dunked under, under the water, did my polar bear plunge, and came out. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, when you're up there, you have to do it. <laughs> so. we, did, we did that once off a fishing boat out of, uh, I think we're out of Sitka. Yeah. And yeah, it was a dare. <laughs> uh, there was some drinking involved, but yeah, it, it was pretty cold. Yeah, it'll wake you up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not as cold as that, I'm pretty sure, though. <laughs> you know, once it goes below a certain temperature, it's just all cold. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Uh, next question in the chat comes from Chuck Junky. Chuck Junky wants to know. Who did all the construction? Was it local workers, or did you bring import workers along with the supplies up with you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for specialty work, such as the swimming pools, th that was actually imported labor just because it is truly a specialty construction. Mm -hmm. um, but for, for building construction, for envelope construction, for addition construction, and then TI build out as well, so the interior building, Mm -hmm. um, that was local, and we, there was always a local hire requirement, and you know, that's first and foremost, that's everywhere really now. And if there were skills that needed to be brought in, we'd bring that in, but um, yeah, there was always some type of local hire. And because it's the largest construction of the largest building in town, of these really tiny towns, Everyone's got a stake in it. Everyone's invested. So, yeah, there's always some type of local activity. Great. Thank you so much. Next question in the chat comes from Lindsay Graves. Lindsay wants to know, were there any interesting animals or marine, or marine life 
uh, you were able to see while in Alaska? Um, I can't say that much marine life. Um, I really, really wanted to see some whale while I was up there, yeah. some type of whale. Um, I did get to see a polar bear from a very far distance because these villages um, have dumps and, you know, just town dumps where mm -hmm. all the rubbish is and refuse is sent. And I think there's actually a picture. There's these dumpsters throughout town and that go get picked up. I mean, that's, they're really, really precious about their waste so that animals don't come into town. Mm -hmm. So the dump and the cemetery are all about a mile and a half out of town. And a polar bear came into the dump one time in Point Lay. And one of the guy, one of the locals there who was working at the school said, Paul, get in the car. And we got in the truck and we drove out and I got to go see that. But I, I, I wasn't that close. It was just yeah. beautiful to see. Um, and then multiple times while I was flying on these bush planes, I would see herds and herds of caribou. Mm -hmm. And one time I got to see a pack of wolves running. And it was so special that even the bush pilot banked, turned, yeah, and we followed the wolves for a while because they're so uncommon to see oh. out you know, during the day. Great experience. It, it was, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Great, thank you so much. Uh, a few more questions from the chat tonight. Next question comes from Chuck Junkie again. Chuck wants to know, are there any other interesting ceremonies, dance, music, ritual, or dance, music, and ritual? Um, I'm sure there are. I, as a, as a white guy from down south, as they would say, I wasn't invited to a lot of uh, anything that didn't have to deal with the entirety of the village. Uh, and if there were special ceremonies or specialty items, they would not talk with me about it. They were pretty, um, pretty reserved at some points in time. If there was food involved, that was community. Everybody's and everyone was, was involved. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and it really became a culture of, and a, and a group where if you need something, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. But if it's my thing, it's my thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wish that I had seen more of that, but I respect their distance as well. Great, thank you so much. Final question of the night comes from uh, Zhuang Kuang. As the pandemic calms down, what is your next dream adventure? Oh, that's a, that's a bucket list question there. Um, my wife and I have a daughter now, and she's 14 months old, born at the very beginning of the pandemic. And I want to go take them and all of us go somewhere. And my, I told you at the beginning that my family would do these things called top secret adventures. Yeah. And it was where my parents would say to my sister and I, you need a swimsuit, a snow parka, your skis, some boots, and your flip flops. And then we'd get in the car or go on a plane somewhere. And we wouldn't know where we were going until we got there. And we would use only half the stuff we were supposed to bring, but that was thrown, you know, told us to throw off. I'd love to plan a top secret adventure for our family and have passport, will travel. As the, as the pandemic winds down, people get vaccinated and borders start to open up. There's a big world out there and I tend to see as much as I can. And keeping the tradition alive with Keep your Keep that kids. tradition alive, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah. Well, Paul, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I think this was, I really enjoyed talking to you and hearing the stories. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm glad to share. It's part of the world that a lot of people don't choose to see and glad to be able to share something and share it with you with the village life. Well, I also, uh, also want to throw a thank you out to, to both yourself and to Jim Heaton for having... Uh, been part of the project of getting our dining room uh, <laughs> ceiling back in order. I'm really <laughs> excited to see this place open back up. We're, uh, Hi, Jim. It's coming along, and hopefully we're going to be opening back up in about two weeks, everyone. So uh, we're doing everything we can to get there. Uh, really appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. Again, if you liked what you saw, go subscribe to our channel, like this video. 
Uh, tune in next week for another interesting program. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.